Okay, I think, Patrick, my friend, I think we are live. Yes, we people are. People are coming in now. Amazing. Hello, world. Hello, everybody. I am going to let everyone file in here. This is always fun watching the little counter at the bottom with like, just like climbing, 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 climbing. I got to get Howard. my glasses. I got to wear my glasses. I guess I want to watch this climbing. <laughs> Did I tell you my wife got uh, laser eye surgery recently? She loves it. It's amazing. I did too in 1996, but it's not quite like it was, what is that, 25, 26 You're years ago. You're an old guy. Jeez. Yeah. I had mine done in like 2009 or something like that. I thought I was an early adopter, but no, that's you. <laughs> that, was, that was real early. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. People are still coming in, Pat. So I think we'll give them a couple of minutes here to, uh, to join. I mean, we actually started, we opened the room a minute or two early. So we'll give them a couple of minutes here. How is everybody doing? Can you hear us? We're just kind of blathering away here, chit-chatting. If you can hear me, please put yes in the chat box. You'll find a Q&A box or a chat box underneath. Just type in yes for me so I know everyone can hear me. Okay, Karen says yes. Alexander says yes. George or Jorge says yes. Alan, John Matthews says yes. Okay, well, we figured out the first part, Patrick. We are live and people can hear us. There's still people joining right now, so I'm, I'm hesitant to get going. Uh, how is everybody doing? I hope no one in today's audience is being hit by a hurricane. I saw some really uh, crazy videos and pictures today. Is anyone uh, in the hurricane zone right now? I still have all the yeses from before, so I'm not sure if any of those other ones. Hi, Cheryl. How are you? Good to see you. Casey says yes. Rodrigo. Okay. I don't think anyone's... Alan says not at the moment, but it's coming our way. Okay. Well, I hope you are prepared, Alan and uh, you and your family are safe. So we really appreciate you joining us for today's presentation. That's amazing. All right. I think, uh, I think we can get into it. What do you say, Pat? Sounds good. Okay. I think I'm going to do it live. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Mikkel Thorpe, and this is the Expat Money Show. Now, this is a webinar that we're going to be doing for Honduras today. I am really excited. I had a chance to visit Honduras geez, about 20 years ago and had such an amazing time there. I actually did my open water scuba diving course there. Actually, no, I did my advanced water scuba diving course there and got to tour through the country. And it really, really is so stunning. So today, what we're going to be doing is a presentation with Patrick Hebert, a fellow Canadian, to talk about some of the opportunities on Honduras, what it looks like from the immigration side, and just life in general in Honduras as an expat. Uh, Pat is going to be doing for us a presentation. It'll take probably about 30 minutes or so, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. So as we go through today's presentation, please make sure that you are using the chat box or the Q&A box, put your questions in there. And at the end of the presentation, we're gonna try to bang these out as many as we possibly can. Um, I'm willing to stay for as long as there are questions. So you guys keep them coming and we'll do our best to answer as much as possible. Uh, and on that note, Pat, I will hand it over to you. I'm gonna turn off my video and my mic and I'll be back in half an hour when you're ready. Knock them dead. Sounds good, thanks, Mikkel. Um, I Appreciate being on the show, and I'm hoping to uh, keep my voice throughout this uh, presentation as I've had a pretty sore throat the last couple of days, but we're going to keep going and, and hope for the best. And Mikkel, I might have to get you to fill in if I lose my voice, but uh, my name is Patrick Hebert. As Mikkel said, I'm originally from Canada, a Canadian citizen, but I'm a resident of uh, several countries down here in Latin America and really make my home in, in, in a number of the countries here with my wife, Andrea. Um, right now, tonight, I'm actually in Panama City, but, uh, you know, we're in Honduras a, a lot, kind of lost count of how many times been there, um, you know, we have a, have a home that we're having built right now in, on the beaches there in, in Honduras, so really love the country, and talk a little bit about the country today, and then uh, a little bit about uh, something you might want to consider as far as, a, you know, an area to live in or, you know, invest in, and, uh, you know, see what you, see what you think. 
So our, our philosophy, I'm one of hey, the co-founders. Pat, sorry to interrupt you for a second. Someone's yeah. saying that they cannot see the slides. Can I get everybody to confirm that you guys can see Patrick's slides? Dave T says he cannot see the slides. So I want to make sure that you guys get to see these because there's going to be some good pictures and stuff in here tonight. Yeah, definitely. We need the slides. It's showing on my side is shared. Everybody says yes. Keith, you can see the slides. You, you gave me a yes. All right. So I think it's just the, the one person. All right. Continue. Sorry well, to interrupt. We'll, we'll have this recorded and hopefully on the recording, you'll be able to see the slides. Amazing. All right. Um, my son and I are co-founders of Eco Villages, and uh, we basically we uh, design and develop communities, sustainable, freedom-oriented communities in a number of different countries and areas of Latin America, uh, Belize, Honduras. Uh, we design communities in El Salvador, several in Nicaragua, working on one in Panama, and so on, and in, in the future, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Argentina. So we're kind of throughout the area and really just... Uh, have certain pillars of, of thought in terms of the way we, we present ourselves as, you know, we're really big on sustainability. And that, a lot of that comes from my son and I uh, living on a boat for a number of years and wanted to apply a whole concept of, you know, catching your own food in that case or, and, and growing your own food and, and being just more self-sustaining, not reliant on corporations or government. And that kind of is part of the liberty and the autonomy that we, we like. And, uh, we believe in eco sensibility, and by eco sensibility, we're not eco freaks or fanatics. We we think, you know, we're a big fan of solar panels and wind turbines and hydropower and things like that. But only, you know, when it also, you know, not only is a feel good thing, but and it also uh, makes financial sense. It saves you on your power bill. I, I don't like paying bills, so anytime I can, you know, air condition my house and keep the lights on with uh, with solar power, I'm pretty excited about that. And efficiency would. One of the uh, things we're gonna talk about later in the presentation today is, is a community of tiny homes, um, great for investment and, and living in, and uh, you know, very efficient, but uh, spacious for their size. So we've kind of pride ourselves on bringing tiny homes to Latin America and uh, you know, generally efficient home design, whether it's, we, we, we design lots of different homes, large homes, estate homes and things, condominium buildings, but we're always trying to be as efficient as possible. So we'll talk a little bit about Honduras, kind of like an Honduras 101 today. What makes Honduras a great opportunity and how can we help you kind of navigate your way through where, where in Honduras might be an area that you, you would really enjoy. So I'm going to go through the, we've got a number of slides, so I'm going to go through them a little quickly. Um, we often, it seems when Mikhail and I do these presentations together, we get a, hundreds of questions. So we want to leave as much room on the back end for questions as we can, which is great. I'd love to answer the questions. That's almost better than the presentation usually because you get a lot more information from the questions. Uh, where is Honduras? It's kind of right in the middle of Central America. Uh, it's south of Mexico or and, and below Belize, if you're familiar where Belize is. Um, it has an east-west running shoreline. The reason we have that in this slide is, you know, it's kind of apt today as, as unfortunately, you know, a hurricane uh, is going through the, the western side of the Gulf side of Florida right now. Um, and the, the nice thing about having um, an east-west running shoreline is the, the, the hurricanes come in, obviously, from the Atlantic Ocean, build as they get into the warmer waters by the Gulf. And, you know, the pro uh, most of the problem with hurricanes, not only the wind, but the storm surge, the wave action that hits the, the shores and, and does so much damage. And a lot of that is caused by the waves slamming, you know, perpendicular into the, into the shoreline and, and, you know, hitting all the oceanfront homes and destroying lots of things. Um, the nice thing about Honduras, first of all, it's a little further south, so it doesn't get hit by that many hurricanes. And, you know, most of them tend to go into the Gulf of Mexico and we're, you know, a few hundred miles south of that. And the other thing is when you have that kind of lateral running shoreline, they, the, the hurricanes skim along it and they don't push the waves up against it. So it, it really makes a huge difference. And it's, you know, much less damaging. Plus they have uh, Bay Islands, they're called Roatan, Utila, that were really a protective of the country in terms of the, the hurricanes that do hit from that side will hit lightly, and, but they'll also hit the, the islands first. So, you know, the reason we put in there is it kind of seemed like you know, something worth mentioning. I'm sure people will have questions about that sort of thing in, in any way. So I just want to bring that up up front. And it's very accessible, Honduras. Um, the number of cities, La Ceiba, San Pedro, Roatan itself, um, 
uh, obviously Tegucigalpa, which is the capital. Um, lots of flights from Miami, Houston, Atlanta, certainly those, you know, the southern states, but also Toronto and Canada, uh, LA, Seattle, different places that have flights directly to, to Honduras as well. So we're going to kind of zone in a little bit here. Honduras is, you know, a reasonable sized country, small by the size, you know, by uh, American or Canadian standards, but but for Central America, it's a mid-sized country. But there's really the kind of one area that's really the tourist hotspot, and it's kind of in that bluish green triangle uh, there with between La Ceiba, Roatan, and Trujillo. And uh, basically, Roatan is really known. Roatan and Utila, the, the little island between La Ceiba, La Ceiba and Roatan, there is Utila, and it's a uh, you know, world renowned for diving. It's got over a hundred beaches on the island. It's it's just a really spectacular spot, very popular. Many people, most people have heard of Roatan. Trujillo is, um, you know, another, a little bit further to the east, um, but again, it's more of a historic uh, Garifuna culture, uh, Mayan type of thing, you know, the culture there, very rich culture, but also beachfront town. So really beautiful place to be. And La Ceiba is a really a, a real nice mix of modern things and traditional cultural things. So we're going to talk a little bit about these more um, coming up in the future here. But um, not to take you know anything away from anywhere else in the country. There's lots of beautiful areas. But given the amount of time we have, we really want to focus on this area uh, because this is really where the, the you know the bulk of the expats go and the and the bulk of the tourism is. So what makes that tourism triangle so popular? Obviously there's beaches. We're on the Caribbean. There's nothing more spectacular than the turquoise waters and the white sands of, of the beaches in the Caribbean. And you know, the, the, there's lots of, you know, obviously like diving, water sports, all those sorts of things. Um, and, and then on top of that, you have amazing fishing because it's not, not, you know, it's not overfished like certain areas. I know if you go to Costa Rica, it's still amazing there too, but it's, it's got a, a lot of overfishing done. So you have less fish. Um, than you have in these areas. So, and then it's a really unusual area here. This, it's very rare that you have the spectacular Caribbean, you know, the beaches, jungles with monkeys in it. And then right beside that really tall mountain range, the Pico Benito mountain range. And uh, it's, it's spectacularly beautiful. We'll, sh we'll show some pictures in a minute here of, of that. If I get, if I get brave, I might play a video. Of, of that we have, but if if I don't get brave because sometimes videos don't work so well on these zooms, then please do send us a, a message at expat at ecovillages.life and we will send you the video to, to watch. It's it's really a, a, a nice, really gives you a good perspective on how beautiful the area is. And one of the other things I didn't mention yet is that other countries like El Salvador that they don't have the Caribbean side, um, you know, they're, 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 they have a Pacific Ocean border their, their, their country. Um, it makes a lot of the people from those, those cities in El Salvador and other Latin American countries come to this part of Honduras because it's so beautiful and they don't have that Caribbean side to their own country. So that, it, you know, it, when it comes to tourism, it really benefits because you get a lot more tourists um, in, in multiple seasons. You get all the North Americans that want to come down in winter or in summer holidays when their kids are out of school. But then you have the shoulder months where a lot of the local um, people or the countries that are nearby, the Latin Americans come as well. And so you, from a tourism standpoint, and which, you know, from a rental standpoint, if you invest in a home down there, it's great because you have a nice flat, you know, always occupied home. And that, you know, really helps with generating rental revenue. I'm going to speed up a little bit on the slides because I know we've got a lot of slides to go through. And if I ramble on everyone, we're going to be in here too long. So we'll talk a little bit about property taxes. Um, established expat communities, uh, some of the residency options over the next slides. And obviously, it, to me, it's a, an amazing quality of life. Honestly, you know, um, for me, Honduras is one of the best places to invest in right now. Um, you know, because when a lot of people hear of Honduras, they just, they, they hear, the, you know, they, they hear what they've heard on CNN or something. And they, they just think, oh, it's not, it's not safe, it, you know, whatever the reasons are. So that's depressed the prices of property. And you'll see, you're going to get an opportunity to get amazing property at a very low price while still having the ability to rent it out at a very nice rate and have a high occupancy. So that's a combination you kind of want to look for if you're if you're buying it for investment reasons. 
and it's a beautiful slot. So if you're buying it for lifestyle reasons, it's great for that too. So the, the country actually rates a single person estimated monthly cost of living is $1,500. Um, I mean, that sounds pretty low, but I still think it's high. I mean, I, I, I think about, okay, you know, you go to a local market to get your groceries, um, you know, all those different things, but I would have a hard time spending $1,500 a month uh, in, in Honduras if I, unless I was going out for dinner like every night or every other night. So, you know, that, that's, that's a, I think, a conservative estimate. So it's a very inexp inexpensive place to live for sure. And of course, that varies a lot. It depends on, you know, do you want to have a, you know, a car that's a gas guzzler and driving all over the place? Or, do you, you know, do you have a home, uh, solar system in your home? Because electricity in these, I mean, in these countries can be fairly expensive. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things that, you know, you, you have to take into account. So that's just kind of a ballpark average. But it helps you kind of budget a little bit for what you might spend if you're living in, in uh, Honduras. So the elephant in the room with Honduras and some of the other countries down here is always safety. You know, how safe is it? And I have one kind of piece of recommendation. Don't listen to people that haven't been there telling you that. And that includes people on, you know, CNN, as far as I'm concerned. You know, the, the, the areas we're talking about, La Ceiba, Roatan, Utila, Trujillo, those are all very beautiful tourist-based areas and they really are very safe. I mean, it, it's a bit of a joke, but you know, use common sense for anything, like you would in any town or city or anywhere in the world when you're traveling. Um, you know, the first thing is don't be a drug dealer, obviously. If you look at the statistics of the countries in, down in this region, and you could, if you could separate gang drug-related crime from just everybody else, you'd realize that, you know, they're, you know, Honduras and Salvador have had gang problems. They're getting a lot better. They're, you know, they're cracking down on that. But those gangs generally are kind of, you know, attacking themselves. They don't really work. They never go after tourists. When you hear that in Mexico, sometimes that they, you know, make an example of a tourist. That just doesn't seem to happen ever in Honduras. So, uh, you know, if you stay out of, out of shady business, you're probably not going to have any issues at all. And of course, you know, just using common sense to maybe don't go into a bad part of town at two in the morning and that sort of thing. But in general, I always feel safe. You know, my kids have been there. My, my wife and I go there all the time and we never feel like any problem. We go out in, you know, La Ceiba is a city we end up hanging out in a lot, go to restaurants and, and different things. So, you know, it, 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 what, what's reported on mainstream media re really is just not what is actually happening in these places. And of course, that's the same for U.S. and Canada, what they report there. So I, I, I guess personal feelings about mainstream media, but so be it. It's, you know, being down here, I can attest to the fact that, you know, that it's just not that, that, that reputation that these countries have is unwarranted. So you might ask the extension of that is really, okay, well, what's the deal with Hondurans at the U.S. southern border? Why are so many crossing the border? It must be because of safety, right? They're trying to get away from a dictator or they're, you know, they're trying to get away from danger or something like that. It's not the case at all. They're looking at the American dream in their eyes is they have a $1 minimum, $1 an hour minimum wage, you know, and versus some states in the U.S. and provinces in Canada are up to $15. So, I mean, if you're looking at another country that's allowing you into their country basically illegally anyway, and you can make 15 times the money, they don't necessarily think about, well, it's going to probably cost me more than 15 times and expenses to live there, but they're just looking at it from the, the income side. Of course, you're going to, you know, if you're having a hard time getting a job, there isn't as many jobs in Honduras as there are, you know, per capita in, as in the U.S. or Canada. So, you know, it's it's really, you know, it's an employment driven thing. It's a, a they believe that they're going to have a much better life. I, I'm sure a lot of them find out that's not really the case. And it's funny because we're seeing a 20 to 30 X um, you know, immigration into these countries down here from U.S., Canada, Australia, Germany, Netherlands, Norway, everywhere, you know, just being flooded with people from other places that would rather live in these countries down here than in theirs, which it makes me kind of wonder, you know, that these poor Hondurans are going up there because they think they're going to make so much more money and a better life, and they probably won't. They've had a pretty good life where they are, but you know, it, it's not like it's reported, you know, they, they're not, they're not claiming, you know, safety refugee status because, it, you know, they, they can't, I mean, they, they, do, they do, I guess, but they, it's not really applicable. 
there's lots of things to experience. I won't go through each of them. Again, like I said, I'll try to keep some of these slides quicker. You can watch the recording and, and you know, pause on anything that you want to see more of. This one I thought was a kind of a fun fact. Uh, the Mayan god Kamazots was the inspiration for the Batman, the recent Batman costume. In 2014, Warner Brothers had a contest where they um, basically wanted to redesign what Batman looked like in their movies. And uh, a guy named Pacheco, the last name of the Christian Pacheco, um, thought of, well, you know what, the Kamazots, Kamazots god from the Mayan culture was the death bat god. It doesn't sound very impressive, but you can certainly see the resemblance. So he won the contest. And uh, this was the, the bust that he made basically that was a Mayan combination with Batman. And uh, it was on display in the Copan Museum, uh, the Mayan Museum there. And uh, apparently a collector bought it. And um, you know, the, the kind of the joke is, well, maybe that collector was Bruce Wayne, right? Batman bought it for himself. But uh, it, 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 no one's seen it since it was bought. So it's kind of, maybe it's in the back cave or something. So let's get on to residency. There's a number of types, types of reven, res, <laughs> residency. Um, you can start in the bottom right corner, unless, you know, unless you're a relative of somebody or marry a uh, Honduran, that one's kind of off the table. Uh, the top left one, you have a renter. You can, you can apply for a rent, what's called a rentista, the renter's residency. Um, you have to prove that you have $2,500 a month of source income uh, that's like passive income from investments and things like that so that you can support yourself. Uh, and uh, that one in the retiree income on the, on the top right is uh, based on $1,500 per month of, of a retirement income. But I don't recommend those top two, the renter and the retiree one, if you can, if you can avoid it, because they're not really considered uh, very strong residencies, honestly, inside the country, because really what these countries are trying to do is they're trying to attract people to invest in their country so they can, you know, build infrastructure and do more things to improve the country, you know, employ more people and all those sorts of things. So they, you know, they, they like the retiree and the renter one because if people will spend a little bit of money, maybe they'll go out for dinner and, and there's some money spent in the country, but it's not the same as the kind of respect and, uh, you know, seriousness you get taken with when you're an investor. And, and one of the nice things about Honduras, it's the second lowest um, residency amount in the in the in the region and that's fifty thousand dollars so obviously just about any home or something like that you want to buy is going to cost more than fifty thousand dollars so you're you know you're covered um, there's a couple of nice things about that too is that um, when you when you go to apply you only have to have paid fifty percent of it um, up front before you can apply of course you have to show that you are going to pay the rest of it um, but there's a there's a, a number of good things that go along with the investor uh, residency visa, and so I, the, you know and the other thing too with that is um, it, it's a pathway to citizenship. So a lot of people looking for a passport, and you know, uh, Honduran passport gets you into the EU, or the UK, a number of different places, number quite a few countries around the world without a visa, and. Uh, the nice thing about the Honduran residency, too, is, well, if you're from another Central American country, it only takes you a year of residency to apply for a citizenship. If you're from Spain, it only takes you two years. And if you're from anywhere else, you can apply um, up as, as early as three years to be a resident. So that's one of the uh, probably one of, if not the fastest residency program in in this region. And uh, so it's one of the least expensive to get residency, and it's one of the quickest to get citizenship from that. So. It's, a, it's got really good advantages on the residency side. On taxes, I mean, that, that's one of the benefits of a lot of these countries here, but obviously the property taxes are extremely low. So, you know, $4 for every $1,000 annually, so 0.4%. Uh, capital gains is a fixed rate of 10%, regardless of the, the amount or what the capital is gained from. Uh, what I really love about these countries is the foreign earned income, which is a 0%. So if you're working, uh, as a kind of digital nomad or working from home type of person and you want to go live in Honduras on the Caribbean beach, you can do that. And if your income is coming from anywhere else in the world but Honduras, you have to pay zero income tax on it. So that, that's a huge benefit. And, you know, actually was one of the main reasons I moved to this region in the first place. I was sick of Canadian taxes, didn't really feel like I was getting the value for the amount of taxes I was paying. So I gave up my Canadian residency 
got residency in a couple of countries down here and they all have this foreign earned income um, approach, which is basically 0% as long as you make your money outside of Honduras. If you start a restaurant or something in Honduras and it's you know employing locals and earning money from local patrons, then, then that's under their normal tax rates, which are still pretty low, but they're not zero. So the pensioners and retirees um, have some exemptions again, as I mentioned, like it's great, you know, for importing a vehicle and some household goods and things tax or Im import duty free, but most people really don't feel like they're getting, you know, the full benefit of a, of a residency um, unless they go for the uh, investor one. So to cut through the noise, we know there's a lot of places that you could potentially decide to choose where to live and, and please, you know, do some more research. We have uh, Honduran relocation webinars on our website and all, all that stuff that you can look up. But honestly, we're just kind of giving you our opinion and, you know, in full disclosure, we're pointing you in the direction of a, a community that we've designed as Eco Villages has designed for a developer that we really believe in and trust. And so, uh, you know, that's important, too, that, because we want to make sure that you have a great experience. So it's one of the best uh, investment values. Plus, we, we know you're going to get what you're paying for. So we, we kind of are suggesting La Ceiba as, as the city. And, and the reason for that, for me, is numerous reasons. I won't go through them all. But the, the biggest thing is, like I said, it's got a great mix of, like, local cultural authenticity mixed with you know, North American chain stores and things. So if you're missing home, you can go to the KFC or Wendy's or McDonald's or whatever. But, and like you see on the pictures here, there's even a Walmart. And the reason we put the Walmart in there is that going back to that point of safety, if there's a Walmart in the city, they've done their homework. They do a lot of research before they put their inventory and their name behind a, a building in, in any particular city in any country. So if Walmart's there, you know that they're, very convinced that it's a safe place and will continue to be stable politically so that um, you know they they can continue to operate and have they make a massive investment when they build a Walmart store and so they've got several in in uh, Honduras so you, you that to me is always one of those kind of telltale signs that okay you know I, I've done my research but you know bigger businesses than me have done their research and they believe in it too. There's a number of things. Um, La Ceiba is actually named after a tree called well, the Tree of Knowledge. It's actually, a, they're huge. Um, somewhere, Spencer and my son and I have a picture of standing in front of one. And, and that picture on the right would be like, you know, the size of the little green bushes at the bottom. Basically, they're massive trees, kind of like the redwoods in California. But there's so many things to do in the area, too. So you have a really good mix of, you know, the nightlife, you know, bars and restaurants and things to do is great, great beaches, obviously. But you also have a lot of nature stuff where hikes, um, zip lining, uh, you know, kayaking and, and whitewater rafting and you know, all sorts of things in the mountains and obviously the jungles. So it's, it's just a very interesting area with a lot of stuff to do. So as, as I said, it's an excellent place to live and or invest. And uh, um, I think I mentioned up front, I, in the, what we're about to show you here in the community that we've designed is... Uh, we've also, you know, purchased, my wife and I have also purchased one for ourselves. So if you end up buying one there, you'll, you'll be our neighbor. I, I, don't, I hope you see that as a good thing and not a bad thing. But, you know, we'd love to have you as neighbors. So the community is called The Reef. It's at a Grand Atlantida Resort. It's, um, it's about nine miles out of La Ceiba, just a few minutes from La Ceiba, on the, right on the beach. Um, you know, and uh, it's just, you know, a very, very pretty area. And uh, we're just going to go through a few house models and a few of the amenities fairly quickly. So Grand Atlantida, you'll see on top there is the, uh, the Caribbean Sea and the Caribbean Ocean. Um, and there's, there's, there's large estate homes on the beach. There's mid-sized homes, there's kind of duplexes, there's condominiums planned. Uh, but right tonight, we're just going to narrow it down and talk about the opportunity to get into tiny homes. Um, that are great. And, and in these climates, too, I want to kind of reiterate that with, with tiny homes. People think, well, I can't live in, you know, something that's that small. But you would actually be surprised when you're in these climates that are beautiful and comfortable all year round. You can really live in the, in the home 
without a problem because you're spending your time in the bedroom, the bathroom, and the kitchen. And the rest of the time you're outdoors. And even if it's still at home, but you're sitting on your deck or you're in the common area, enjoying watching some live music or whatever it is. And you really, you don't need those great rooms and those massive dining rooms and all those different things. Because when you're entertaining people, especially on the homes you're about to see, you're going to be sitting on your deck. Um, some of them are on the, on the rooftop decks where you have like unparalleled, you know, views of the mountains and the ocean all around you. So, you know, it, it's, it's pretty spectacular. Again, you can see the, the homes in the little red stamps. There are the ones that are bought and under construction. A number of them will be completed here in the next month or so. And uh, they want to be ready for this, this year's kind of high North American travel season. So they're, they'll be done pretty soon. I'm excited to have ours done in the next couple months. And you can see at the top, um, you know, the, obviously the beach, but the, uh, the amenities uh, there too. We'll zoom in a little bit on that. But, you know, there's lots of things, you know, in terms of the sustainability side, you've got the, on the bottom, you'll have, you know, these pathways through the jungle, but also orchards you know, community orchards, community gardens, and things where, you know, when it comes back to your cost of living, it can be almost free for groceries if, you, if you're growing your own food. And, you know, a lot of people do that in the area. Like I mentioned earlier, these, these homes are eco-sensible. I'm not going to go too much in depth on it. We do a lot of hybrid solar. We, you know, having solar power homes really cuts back on your power bill. These are hybrids, so you're connected to the regular grid power as well. Um, Gray water recycling, and going to use the water that comes from your, after you shower down the drain and it goes into your, in, you know, into your garden or in, into your yard for the grass or, or whatever you want to use it for. Um, and of course that's separated from your toilet, the black water, and that goes into a treated system. And I, as I mentioned, the community orchards and gardens really help you be, you know, live a sustainable life if you want to. I mean, you can always, you know, groceries are very inexpensive in Honduras. So you can go to, especially if you go to outdoor markets and, I, I, my wife and I really love doing that because you can go and, you know, pick your stuff yourself and it's all, you know, very organic and, and very, very inexpensive. But you can always go to, you know, the big, big grocery stores, supermarkets as well and, and get anything you want. You know, it's going to be a little more expensive if it's imported, but, you know, it's, a, it's totally your choice. So we're going to go through the homes very quickly. They start at 109,000. So get this, you're going to have a home. So one bedroom, one bath with a full upper deck, 360 degree view of mountains and ocean and, you know, the jungle and monkeys. There's howler monkeys and capuchin monkeys um, right in the area. In fact, they have this little tree that they decided was their border and the howlers are on one side and the capuchins on the other. There's a natural um, spring that runs through there just within a couple hundred feet of your home. And the monkeys come down there usually around late afternoon to, to drink before they go to sleep. And, Sometimes you get to see them kind of arguing with each other because they're the two species don't really like each other that much. But the, I mean, uh, this the Pearl of Homes are are amazing. And again, you're you're talking about being on the beach in the Caribbean at at a hundred and under one hundred and ten thousand dollars. And there's the layout. You have a you know a nice comfortable bedroom. Very these are all very modern, brand new homes. Rooftop decks, open kitchen and design. You know you've got your know, storage. You know, laundry, got, um, you know, your batteries for um, solar systems and things like that. So it's all been thought out and very efficiently designed. The coral model is uh, 119,000. It's a little bit, little bit bigger. It's still one bedroom, one bathroom, but it's a lofted model. Um, if, you know, a lot of people like to live on one floor, but if you like that loft design, it's really cool. You get, you know, upstairs, You've got your bedroom separated from the living space and you've got a, you know, kind of a wraparound deck on the, on the second floor as well as on the first floor. You can see the, the floor plan there. Again, um, that open to below area can be netted so that you can literally, you know, guests want to come over and they have kids and then they, they think it's really cool, throw a, a you know, mattress or sleeping bag on the net and sleep above everybody else. You know, the kids love that. The Delphine model is actually a two bedroom, two bathroom, tiny home, which we've kind of created probably the first two bedroom, two bath, tiny homes in maybe in the world. They're just not typical because these are concrete 
solid concrete and steel homes. They'll be hundred. They'll be here hundreds of years from now. These are not your typical what you think of a tiny home that's like a trailer on wheels. These are not on wheels. They're a full foundation. They're just a smaller version of a real home. But uh, that allows us to do a lot of design things that other tiny homes can't do. So you have an up, upper deck with an upper bedroom and bathroom upstairs, and then one on the lower deck as well. And again, for under $130,000, uh, and these things rent will rent amazingly well because you know a, a couple with a, you know kids can can rent these out. They're always way more popular than condominiums because they're separate units, right? They're not. You know, sharing walls and noise, right? You're separated from everybody else. Uh, you have your own very little, you know, home right beside, right beside the beach. So it's pretty hard to beat. There's amazing common area. We really had Spencer and I really had fun designing this together with our architect team. Um, there's a there's a music stage. There's actually going to be a little music studio for anybody that wants to kind of record themselves on playing guitar or piano or whatever. Um, there's a you know, really interesting pool right beside the white sand beach, uh, and then a, a lot of little kiosks. So if you were interested in having your own little store, maybe you don't want to fully retire or work from home, you kind of want to have a little business here in Honduras, you could potentially lease out one of these kiosk buildings and have, you know, maybe it's a swimsuit shop or a dive shop or ice cream shop or whatever it is, you know, whatever you think might be interesting for people in the community. And, uh, you know, that that... That, to me, that's a really cool thing, and it gives everybody. It's these these areas just become the gathering spot for people, so it's a lot of fun. And like I said, like there's incredible views. You, this picture on the right, there is a video. I'll probably, um, in, maybe when we get into the question and answers, I might play the video. But right now, I'll just keep running through here. But these are the homes under construction right now. This is from a few weeks back. Um, there's there's about 17 of them in total. The picture doesn't include all of them. But they're, you can see how close to the waterfront they are. It's a bit high tide there, so the beach doesn't look quite as nice as it normally does. But in the jungle right behind them there, like I said, there's parrots and monkeys and things like that. It's very, very cool. It trails through there. So, And then you can see the Pico Bonito Mountain on the, on the back top left there, which is actually 8,000 feet tall and only you know, 10, 15 miles back from, from the reef. So it's, it's an, a spectacular area. You don't normally get... Caribbean and mountains and all this combined into one location. So you can see why it's a popular tourist spot. We did a quick little home comparison. Uh, I guess uh, St. Petersburg, Florida is a you know, 700 square foot home for 299, two bedroom, one bath, built you know, 70 years ago. And then compared to this, but that, that's not even close to the beach. Well, it's close, it's two miles from the beach. And then these homes, like the like the Delphine, is two bedroom, two bath, a little bit smaller, but it's brand new, much more efficiently built, so it will feel feel bigger. And it's a couple hundred feet at most from you know from the from the actual Caribbean Ocean, so it doesn't get much better. To you know, you can see what you get for your money. And these prices, we're going to talk about that in a second, but these prices are are going to go up. Um, there's only six homes left in the phase. And when they go open, when the developer opens up the next phase, these prices will go up a lot, quite a bit. They're, they, they've gone up already, but, um, you know, they're, they're going to continue to go up. There's been, a, you know, obviously a lot of interest and, and demand. And every time a new phase is open, the developers tend to really lift the prices quite a lot. I won't go into the complete details here of the ROI, but you can see that, you know, you're looking at very likely double digit to, you know, upwards and get closing in on, you know, 12 to 20% in uh, a return on investment um, if you're, if you're going to rent the home out. So if, you know, for, for someone like my wife and I, we, we have a couple of tiny homes in different places, you know, some in the Pacific, some here in the Caribbean, um, and we're able to, you know, use it ourselves for a couple of weeks or a month of the year and, you know, visit our friends in, in the reef and then, and then rent it out the rest of the year, and it basically, you know, pays for more than pays for itself. And uh, you know, it's it's really it's a great great investment, and and that doesn't even take into account like the capital gains. We've been very conservative on the capital gains too. You know, they've seen considerably more than than twelve percent over the last year. But you know that that we want to try to be conservative on all of these. So that's why we actually have two columns, kind of like a right hand side is more of a worst case scenario, and the middle is you know, even a conservative expected case. They have, because of this area has, you know, the North American, European, you know, and other parts of the world, Australian, 
uh, you know, tourists coming in. Generally, those tourists will come in, you know, from November to May. And then again, you know, in the summer holidays, kind of like July, August time frame. And then the rest of the year is kind of the gaps are filled in by, you know, the more affluent El Salvadorians from San Salvador who don't have the Caribbean in El Salvador and they want to come and spend time on the Caribbean beach. And they're renting these out and they they tend to come, you know, for a couple of weeks at a time. And and, uh, you know, so you 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 really end up having amazing occupancy and, and maintaining a really good ADR average daily rate. Uh, on rentals. So, uh, you know, I, I find these, you know, an excellent, an excellent investment. Now, these are, these are predictions. They're based on what we've seen in the area, what we've seen in other communities that we've got, we have designed and developed. So we, we're confident in them and we're confident we're being conservative, but of course, you know, we can't guarantee you something like COVID hits again and nobody can travel. Well, you know, you're, you're going to, you're going to be out of luck on that for however long that lasts. So like I said, there's only six homes left in this current phase. If you are interested in this at all, I would get involved soon. Um, I expect that in, you know, probably from this webinar, we could likely sell that out. And then again, the prices will go up and we don't really have control over that. We are in this, in the reef, we are the designer. Grand Atlanta is the developer. Um, they, they control the prices. And so I know I, I highly recommend you get in as soon as you can. So the next steps are pretty straightforward. You you can request uh, the brochure from us, which has more detail on which properties are available, still remaining. Uh, if you like one of the home models, you pick one of those, you pick the property you'd like to put it on. And then we have a $2,500 earnest money, basically a refundable, fully refundable reservation fee. And uh, that, that gives you, then we send you the sales purchasing ag agreements and, um, you have 10 business days to, to look over them and make sure you're happy with them. You know, the property management is on-site property management and how that will work, um, what your rental uh, agreement would be and all those HOA agreements and all those things that go along with it. And then if, you, if you're happy, then what we typically do is there's a 50% down payment. And if you, if you require financing, you can talk to us about that on an individual basis. But generally it's 50% down. And then 20% on the uh, foundation is built or completed, 20% when the walls are up and 10% when the keys are handed over to you. So that, that's the typical approach. So it's pretty easy to get in, um, you know, just contact us and it's at expat at ecovillages.life. And I think I got through it in well, roughly 40, 40 minutes, Mikel, so it wasn't too far off. No, you did good. You did really good. God, those places are gorgeous. I like the ones with the the balcony at the top or the whole floor. I know it's the smaller of the units, but I love that balcony. I think it looks amazing. Yeah, it was it was interesting. Spencer and I were there a couple of weeks ago, and um, you know, obviously, it's nice having the two bedroom because you, rental wise, it's it's going to rent more. You're going to get a higher mm -hmm. rate for it, um, and obviously, for you know, if you want to go with family or whatever, you've got an extra bedroom. But I got to admit, it is pretty nice on that 360 view top floor. Uh, but they do have an upgrade option for um, for those models that have an up, upper deck as well to to basically have a, a drop down staircase that you can go onto the top floor of the second floor, which gets you even higher and still gets you that 360 view. So uh, right. it's not a very expensive option. So you can combine kind of the best of both worlds there. Well, can you put a barbecue up on the roof? Because then I'm sold. If I could, if you I could put a churrasco up there, then I'm I'm so stoked. <laughs> you could put barbecue wherever you like. Amazing. Okay. But this isn't this isn't condo rules. You can do what you want. Right? True. 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 Okay. So, oh, this is what we're gonna do. We'll stay on for probably the next half an hour to one hour to do q a so start putting in your questions there's a little button at the bottom that says q and a i've already got some questions in and i just wanted to read this one first for you uh gao shan says i'm interested i want to see the plot plan etc put me on the list exclamation point amazing gao shan Perfect. that's fantastic uh i would say we could officially put gao shan as number one so maybe right. that would be save one. Gao Shan's a, a client of mine and a really interesting guy, amazing human being. So I'm really excited for you. That's We'd so like to have you as a neighbor. Excellent. Okay, Chris Harrison. Chris, good to see you at dinner last night. 
He says, I think I'm in. Can you have Pat? Can you have Pat send me the details on availability? Pat, please uh, send Chris yeah, the it'll, details. It'll likely... on Sorry, it'll likely be Andrea that sends you information probably following up tomorrow or the day after once we gather all the questions and, and emails. But yes, absolutely. And like I said, we have a brochure that has more details and Andrea can, you know, answer any any question you have. Amazing. Chris, did you get that? So Andrea will be in touch. She'll send you the information. Same uh, Gaoshan, probably it will be Andrea, uh, Patrick's wife, who will send you this stuff. Okay, let's run through these. I'm going to scroll back up to the top and we'll go through these one by one. Um, okay, Sandra has a two-part question. I'm going to ask them uh, separate. We'll go through them from there. Okay, so number one is how reliable is the electrical grid there, the electricity? Well, it's actually quite reliable. Um, you know, obviously every country in Latin America is somewhat less reliable than, than other, you know, North America, but the beauty of that is we don't really care. We're putting in hybrid solar systems. So you're going to have power. You know, there, there's, you know, you're going to use your, the solar, the solar panels are going to charge your batteries. You're going to run off of that whenever possible because not using power from the grid is costing you zero dollars. And then obviously if the grid power goes out, you have the battery to back you up. So, I mean, we have, we have many uh, hybrid homes in other communities and it's funny because most times people don't even, the, the people that live in those homes don't even know the power went out because it, it flips over so quickly. And the other thing is the only reason they know is because a bunch of people are at their front door wanting to charge their, their iPhones and tablets and stuff because you know people without the solar systems don't mm -hmm. have any power and, and they do. So you know, everybody's plugging into everything, right? So yeah, yeah I it, saw this question come in and I just kind of smiled. I'm like, well, you know, Latin America is not perfect uh, for electricity, but it doesn't really matter in a community like this that has solar. We're protected. Yeah, and, and like like you and I right now are in condominiums in Panama City, and that's uh, kind of a pain if the power goes out because I can't I can't put my own solar system in the condo, um, but I can on my own house. So that that's you know it's way nicer to have the the, the hybrid grid systems. And just to clarify, the solar that is that you quoted and showed in the images today, that's included in the price, right? That's not an add-on or a bonus or more cost. That's included in the house of- the Yeah, in fact, house, we, did, correct? we didn't even mention that in a comparison with the other home. I can guarantee you that 1950s home didn't have solar system in it. The, yeah, this is that's included in the price. The only thing that's extra is uh, like furniture appliance package that you can pick and, sure, that and, makes sense. and, some, and some closing costs, but- you know, you're, you're in that ballpark. And, but yeah, you get, the, you get the hybrid solar system built into the package. That's amazing. Okay, part two of the question. Also, is there high-speed internet, like fiber or cable, or what is the internet situation like? Yeah, actually, just this last month, they're laying uh, fiber optic lines in the, in the resort. They had been, they had been using, um, like, uh, you know, cellular and then, and then wired. But now they're, they're, they're putting in fiber, and so you can pretty much pay for whatever speed you want. It's not, not terribly expensive, but it, the beauty of that is it's kind of unlimited, too. And then, of course, with things like, you know, Elon Musk, Starlink and stuff like that, then, you know, that gives you other options as well. So for people who work remote or digital nomads or who need to still run their businesses while they're overseas, this should work well for them then. It'll it'll work perfectly. I mean, I, I would never buy a home where I couldn't have high speed internet because, I, you know, like you, Mikhail, we're, we're on video calls and then doing things all day long, right? So for could, sure, could never get away without that. Amazing. Okay, Hannibal would like to know, uh, is it possible to get AliExpress or Amazon dropshipping or these types of things in La Ceiba? Yes, they have a thing. I can't remember the name of it in Honduras right now. It's, it's basically like a mailbox, et cetera, type of uh, thing where in, in La Ceiba, you can, they give you, a, they give you a Florida address. And when you send something to that Florida address, is it auto forwards to, to La Ceiba. So similar to what we have in Panama. We exactly. Hot Express or Mailbox, et cetera, or something like that. Um, yeah. I think in Panama, it's like $3 a box and then you pay like a monthly fee. I think we pay $50 a month and then $3 for every box that comes in. So I literally have Amazon stuff that comes here to Panama every day. So that's amazing yeah. that you can do it in Honduras too. Uh, Sandra would like to know, does the HOA allow pets? 
Yes. Um, the, you know, one of the nice things about this community is we've really worked with a developer to create the HOA ourselves. And we made it very light. You'll see if you ask for the, you know, the purchase agreements and the HOA documents, you'll see it. Um, and yeah, I mean, the developer himself lives, the, the main guy, Jeff Hines, lives on and works with John Breshers. They, they live on site. They have horses, they have dogs and cats, I think. And so, you know, obviously they, you know, you, you want to have some level of respect for things. You don't want your, you know, dog running into everybody's home all day long or whatever, but you know, that that's, that's just common sense. Right. So, but yeah, you can have pets and most okay. people do. Amazing. Okay. Uh, there's no name on this one. It just says anonymous, but I, he or she asks, how close are the nearest restaurants and live music ve venues for vacationers? What are the local transportation options for vacationers? And part three would be, will there be a community backup generator? So I think they're, they're really thinking about things from a um, putting it in the rental pool or renting it out on Airbnb and what it might look like for them, I guess. Yeah, like soon we're going to have the, you know, an on-site restaurant in those kiosks and things like that. But they're, let's say, but like I said, it's only 10 minutes away. It's got a golf course. It's got hundreds of restaurants, um, you know, lots of, lots of chain restaurants, lots of unique kind of hole in the wall restaurants and some nice high end fine dining restaurants. So you've got the whole gamut. It's a, it's a decent sized city, you know, with a few hundred thousand people. And so it's, it's got pretty much everything. Like I said, once, once you have a Walmart, you pretty much got everything else too. But um, sorry, what was the other parts of that question? I just, put it as answered they one of the one was the transportation for the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. like uh you know getting around for vacationers things like that and the second one or the third one was about generators uh for the compound yeah the um the transportation is very simple a lot of people choose not i mean i like having a vehicle wherever i am so i can go exploring on my own time but um, a lot of people don't have vehicles there at all um you know the cabs between La Ceiba and uh, well anywhere and and uh, and the property are you know very cheap probably you know a couple dollars whatever back and forth and then there's also a, a ferry terminal for the the ferry that goes out to Roatan and that's a beautiful ferry ride for about an hour and fifteen hour and a half minutes um, and it's uh you know you could go there for a couple bucks on a cab and then get on the ferry and go over to Roatan and of course you can take cabs all around Roatan too so. Um, you know, I, I haven't really seen Uber being a thing yet there, but uh, I, I think it's coming. But right now, you know, the beauty about taxis in Central America is they're extremely inexpensive. Okay. And, and the generator, um, there's no community-based generator. You can obviously have a generator for your own house if you're, if you're concerned, but we really feel like the batteries and the solar system kind of replaces that. If you, you know, it, it's not a bad idea, I guess, if you're getting you know, three days of socked in rain and you're just not generating much power. And for some reason, the grid also goes down. Um, you know, you could have, you know, a, a little Honda generator or something as a backup, but it's re really kind of unnecessary. Well, and then I think as well, don't have an electric stove. Don't right. be running an electric kettle 50 times a day and, you know, all this yeah. electricity based stuff, you know, try to I use mean, alternatives. We Exactly. I mean, we when we're building these homes and the systems inside the homes, we we think of the generation like solar power generation, but we also think of the of the draw. Like, what is you know, like you said, we we don't we don't we have gas dryers like clothing dryers, we have gas stoves. Um, you know, the only thing is really your fridge. That's a major appliance that's electric, and nowadays they're pretty efficient. And then the air conditioning is the other big draw. And so we build around those main things. But yeah, if you're if you're going to have a massive cappuccino maker or something and leave it on all day, then I would, you know, recommend you, you, you get a French press or something instead. <laughs> I do like a good cappuccino. <laughs> well, you, you can make it, just don't leave it on all day because you're using all your electricity. So. There we go. Okay. Jerry would like to know, does Honduras allow dual citizenship or multi-citizenships? I can take care of this. Yes. Yes, they do. They allow and recognize dual nationality. So that is a very nice thing about Honduras. Uh, Keith says, a couple of questions and nice presentation. Pat, how far Thank from you. the airport is the community and how many acres is the development? 
the development is, is, is large. I think it's like 800 acres or something like that. So what we were showing is just a very small first phase piece of it. And they tend to grow out from there. And the airport's about 10 or 15 minutes away. I mean, it depends on traffic Amazing. a little bit, but, it, but it's very close to the Saba airport. It's an international airport. Um, I usually take, you know, to come back to Panama uh, or Miami. Well, Miami, I mean, COVID kind of screwed up a lot of flights, right? Uh, just about everywhere in the world, right? But uh, under normal circumstances, you could go um, directly from Panama City to La Ceiba. Um, you could go from La Ceiba to Miami. But a lot of them are now um, run through San Pedro, which is a bigger city just to the north, and and then a, and then a kind of a little smaller plane that goes between San Pedro and La Ceiba. Or Roatan. Roatan gets so many tourists that they have an airport on the island as well. And again, I often fly into Roatan and then take the ferry to La Ceiba, sort of backwards of going to Roatan. So there's a lot, a lot of options for, for access. Fantastic. Uh, okay, Karen would like to know about the HOA fees. Maybe you can actually go back in your slides and pull up because I did see that it was mentioned there, some of the HOA fees. I, you know, I don't think we actually did mention HOA fees. Are you sure? Um, I think you would yeah. go back onto that one because I'm- well, You might have sure. to help me and tell me which slide I was on then. Sure, go back to the the perspective on the investments, um, this ah, one yes. here. Okay, let me just get rid of some of the stuff that's in front of I'm it. I'm going to lean in to, to squint on this. I think I'm getting yeah, it. So I knew I saw it. Owner annual okay. expenses, second from yeah. there. Let me, cal let me calculate that really quickly. <laughs> I knew it. So it's, yeah, it was, I thought it was. It's $168 a month. And that, that covers your, you know, security, uh, landscaping around the property, obviously taking care of the roads and, and you, know, you know, infrastructure and all those sorts of things. So it's, it's a pretty low, and, and you know, I think you and I talked about this the other day, Mikkel. A lot of people get drawn in or kind of sucked into this idea of like the lower the HOA, the better. And that's actually the opposite of what you should be looking at. Not that you should be radically high, but that it's reasonable because any developer that says, oh, you know, our HOA is only $40 a month or something. Well, you can be sure that development isn't going to be there in five years. It's going to sure. be bank bankrupt or really run down and you're your asset is going to get run down with it. So, and the value is going to collapse. So I always look, you know, we help the developers actually, you know, define the HOA because, and, and the fees for it, because we kind of know what these things, what these places cost to, to keep going. And it's, it's a, it's a small price to pay for, you know, being able to sleep at night and knowing that there's enough money in the kitty to, to do all the things you need to do in the HOA. Absolutely. And I just like to point out as well with the numbers that Pat has put up there, I know Pat very well and the conservative nature when he ever puts these types of things forwards, but you'll see actually this is after all of the net operating costs, all the HOA, everything included. So if you are looking at using this as an investment portfolio, put it in your investment portfolio this already accounts for the HOA and everything like that. This is your net net at the end of it. So, Yeah, and, and I think it's an, an awesome thing to diversify into right now. I, you know, again, you and I were talking about that earlier today too, Mikhail, is that, you know, that with this, what's going on with the stock market and, and inflation and everything like that, these places are kind of going, you know, talking to people in Canada recently, you know, in, in Canada, you know, the inflation is, is going to start killing the housing prices because you know, obviously the interest rates go up, people can't make their mortgage payments, they might have to default, the bank takes it, the bank dumps the home back on the market cheap, prices start plummeting, right? That's just a natural cycle of things. But that isn't happening in this area, right? People weren't extended like that, they're not in that situation. And this is a, becoming a more and more popular tourist area. So while, you know, Canadian home prices and, and US home prices might be dropping, these are going up. So in terms of diversifying away from the stock market or even real estate in North America, I, I personally think these are great options. Well, absolutely. I mean, with stock market, we're down what? Depending which market we're talking about, if we're talking the NASDAQ or the S&P, I mean, you can be down upwards of 30% at the moment. And yeah. it's just a bloodbath out there right now. I mean, this is the time to get your money out and put it into really safe, tangible assets. And this is land that you own, your own home. You know, if you're paying it off, we're not talking about, you know, 
1% down and mortgage to the tits and then like things you can't afford. These are very affordable homes. I think, uh, I think it's a very prudent and very smart move. Uh, you know, the other move. thing just on that, on that kind of diversification play is um, in my experience, back in 2008, when we had the previous recession, which we're probably moving into again, um, that I was worried, right? We had a new community coming out of the ground and I was like, oh no, I'm never going to sell another home. The world is collapsing. And it, the opposite happened. We sold it out very quickly because people were going, well, what can I buy that's going to be more stable? Where can I get value for my money? And they were buying down in this region versus, you know, in North America. And they're taking their money out of the stock market and then putting it into, into real estate or property where, you know, at very least if it didn't, you know, didn't go up ma magically, you know, in enormously, at least it was stable and, you know, the, it, it continued to add value every year. So, you know, it, it's interesting because sometimes it's kind of the opposite of intuitive, right? You think, oh, the market's collapsing and, you know, the la the first thing that's going to go is kind of vacation homes or, off, you know, offshore investments and things like that. And it's not, it's not what I've seen, actually. Yeah, absolutely. So... Uh, Scott Thompson says, very interested. Please send the information. Thank you, Scott. So we will get Andrea to send you the information as well, Scott. Or you can also send uh, send an email um, and request some information. Um, the email address again, Pat, was what? expat at ecovillages.life. It's .life, not .com. So please make sure you use expat at ecovillages.life. And we'll get back to you very quickly. Uh, Andrea is amazing at responsiveness. So you know, don't be surprised if you send a three in the morning message and you get a response at 3.05. It's oh, just wow. the way she is. She'll kill me for saying that, but it is the way she is. <laughs> and we appreciate it. Oh, here we go. Okay. John Matthew says, put me in the queue for the Delphin model closest to the beach. I'm all in. That's amazing. John, I'm so happy for you. That's so awesome. Perfect. All right. Welcome to the welcome to the community. Yeah, you will we'll all be neighbors down there. This is yeah. gonna be amazing. We were laughing last night at dinner is how many communities are we gonna all be neighbors in? Yeah, we're, I think we're, we're gonna... already three, possibly <laughs> going on four right now. So yeah. it's great though. I mean, we did a big dinner here last night for a lot of my private clients, and Pat was there. We had 20 some odd people there, and it was just the most amazing group of people best conversations and just i love my clients so much so, so yeah, it was it was i was great i was want to say that too like if if that's the kind of people we're going to have in these communities it's going to be a lot of fun because there are a lot of yeah. like-minded people uh, you know no there was no division no divisiveness no nothing it was just a really really nice dinner i really enjoyed meeting a lot of the people i hadn't met yet so. yeah it was so much fun we had lebanese food okay continuing on with questions so bruce would like to know is the climate similar to the beach areas of Panama, as in wet slash dry seasons, humidity and temperatures. Yes and no. the The Caribbean has a little bit different weather than the Pacific side. So on the Pacific side, like the Pacific side of Panama, Pacific side of well, Panama is even a little wetter than just about everywhere, to be honest. In in this region, not to go, you know, my wife always jokes about I should have been a meteorologist because I'm always talking about the the weather, but. The, the jet stream that comes through this area, the reason there's a Darien Gap in the, the, the area, area called the Darien Gap in, or in Eastern Panama is that's kind of where the jet stream splits up. So my wife is in Ecuador right now. So it's their, it's their summer, whatever, their dry season. I call it summer. I don't know what they call it, but it's their dry season. Whereas right now here, it's our wet season. And we're just, we're not that far away from Ecuador. It's just that that, that jet stream goes right between there. So from the, from the Darien Gap upwards, it gets, the further far, the further you go upwards, it gets a little drier, but the wet season is May to October and the dry season is uh, December to, to April or May. And that's on the Pacific side. It's not quite as cut and dried on the Caribbean side. You can get rain kind of any particular day of the year, but in general, you know, the same theory goes. The, the, what we consider North American winter is the drier time and the summer being the, the wetter time. But I, I like both seasons. I mean, you know, I, I, I love Panama, but I think Panama City is a little bit too humid sometimes. Yeah, but, we, uh, you know. it's hot and humid here, but we have other cool things about Panama. Uh, like, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not dissing Panama at all. I, I love it, obviously, I, you know, stay here a, a lot. So, but um, 
you know, the, there, but the nice is thing is bit... to have options, like instead of just yeah. being in one place and putting all your eggs in one basket, having a tiny home in Honduras, I think definitely ticks that box because then if you get sick of the humidity here and you want to go down to the beach, going down to Honduras is an amazing option. So, yeah, exactly. And, and you, you know, you get just such a different type of experience in each, in each one of the communities. So with the price points, you know, and just, a, you know, a little over a hundred thousand dollars, which is pretty hard to find a home and, you know, anywhere else in the world for that kind of price range. So you, you can, you know, we, we do see a lot of people buying two different homes or three different homes and saying, I'm going to spend four months in this one, four months in that one, four months in that one. And it's in different locations, sometimes in the Highlands, sometimes on the beach, get a lot of different environment to, to, to explore. And then when I'm not there, I'm going to rent it out and it's going to pay for the rest of my life. So. Well, absolutely. I mean, I have a lot of clients who are um, also Canadian, fellow Canadians, and they're getting out of the Canadian market. And, you know, you get these little crack shack houses in Toronto or just outside of Toronto, <laughs> and they're like $800,000. And it's like, okay, cash out of that and then come down to Central America, pay for the place in cash, you know, have a couple of them in different communities, rent them out when you're not using them and actually get an income and you're down on the beach and you can still run your business or work remotely or, you know, any of these types of things. I mean, it just makes so much sense for so many people. Yeah. Well, and, and the tax consequences too, right? I mean, if you lose your residency up here and become a resident down down here you're, and, you're, and your revenue is not coming from Honduras, for instance, then it's tax-free, right? So it's... Exactly. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm, I'm out in touch with the housing market in North America. I was up, you know, had a, had a grandson recently and I was up visiting and, and my son and I were just kind of talking about and looking at, you know, homes in the, in the market and... You know, on Vancouver Island, it's just, you know, there's basically nothing for under a million dollars and that's not a pretty home, right? It's, it's crazy. And I feel guilty down here talking to somebody and saying, oh, they get this beautiful beachfront home for $200,000. And, you know, I've, I've obviously been gone too long to understand the market up there anymore. <laughs> okay. George would like to, uh, like to know slash says uh, he's interested, but he needs more information. He would like to see the cost of bigger houses three bedrooms, three bathroom type of places. Uh, in this community, you talked mostly about tiny homes. Is it possible to put larger homes in this community or yes. not? Yeah, and because of time, you know, certainly send us a message at expat at ecovillages.life and we will get back to you. There's some beautiful, massive estate homes right on the beach, you know, right near this community. It's all within Grand Atlantida, the same resort communities. You have all the same amenities, same same perks and everything so um you know there you can have mid-sized homes like i said there's some kind of sort of more duplex style homes and uh you know really beautiful homes of all sizes so it's not just tiny homes we realize that tiny homes aren't for everybody but um you know it, it's a still it's just you get all the perks of that and you can you can put together a, a, a you know you can buy an oceanfront lot uh, that you know is quite a bit larger and then you work with the with, with us to design a home and, 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 you know, get your sort of custom built home on a lot and, uh, you know, still for a really amazing price. Okay. Fantastic. Um, Valerie would like to know the solar systems include battery pack up for the nighttime outages. Yes. Perfect. I mean, they're, they're, we, we, we've put in, we've designed, you know, not the most massive solar systems because you, you, when you get into the solar system design, you, you, you soon realize if you're, if, you're, you know, if you're building them or designing them for the absolute worst case scenario, you can spend a lot of money on them and you can be, and, and they're huge. But we, you know, we, we've decided that we're gonna put this kind of rate in there, this kind of typical usage. And then if you want, you can go crazy. If you wanna be totally off grid, um, not use any grid power, you can expand them yourself and, or have somebody expand them for you. And so, the sky's the limit on that, but yes, you know, um, you, you, you're, you're, you're pretty protected against power outages if, if you use the system smartly. And there's a lot of different things you, you can do with that. So. Okay, perfect. Uh, Mike asks, okay, will a recording be available after? Sorry for arriving late. I'd love to review the materials and watch the recording. Yes, Mike, we will send out the recording 
for everybody who has registered today. So we'll make sure that we get you a copy of this if you miss the beginning. This is also really good for anybody who's watching tonight and they want their spouse to watch or their business partner or something like that, then we'll send you the recording and then they can watch the whole thing so that you don't have to try to you know, explain the entire 40 minute presentation from scratch <laughs> for it. Um, it's always good to let them watch things. Okay, Alan says, how long between ordering and delivery? Well, with the tiny home, it depends obviously on the size of home. We just talked a little bit about, you know, larger homes, like maybe three, 4,000 square feet homes obviously take longer, but these typically will take, you know, I'd say an average, you can count on like eight, eight months, six to 10 months is, is a pretty good time frame for, uh, you know, obviously it's concrete foundations take time to cure and, these aren't your typical North American stick homes that, you know, the frames come up so fast. Uh, these are these are full, you know, steel reinforced concrete homes, take a little bit longer to build, but they're also, they're gonna be there forever. So it's you know, worth, a, worth a couple extra months to wait. Yeah, well, six months is quite good. And you also have to understand uh, for my Canadian brothers and sisters, we can build year round here in Central America. So it's not like, right. You know, it's not like we have to get the snow or something. It's seasonal or anything like that. So. Year, year round, except the only exception to that is if, you know, this year we've had an unusual amount of rain on, on a lot of parts of the, of the region. And so sometimes you get slowed down by that and in True. some cases get stopped by that. But but you're right. It's not it's not because it's snowing or too cold. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Andre says, we are a family of five. Is the 2-2 two -two home going to be a bit small for us? No three bedrooms in this community? So kind of answered that one already, but just uh, once again, yes, it is possible to get larger homes. If you guys reach out to Patrick and Andrea and, and the rest of the team, then they can walk you through different models. I just asked Pat to make sure that in today's presentation, we didn't take too, too long and just kind of show some of the, the options which we thought were the most popular. But definitely yeah. there's... Uh, options for larger homes as well. And, and if you did want to make a visit there, you can even tour some of the three and four bedroom homes. Amazing. Okay, Rodrigo would like to know, hi guys, what is the import duty in Honduras? Are imported goods and cars more affordable than say in Costa Rica? Um, well, it depends like if you're you know going with a retirement residency or something, you get some breaks on, on that. Uh, it's all over the map, honestly. I, I don't really want to throw out too many percentages. You can probably Google it pretty easily, but you know, a car will be different than you know a TV, and it's different than a you know household furniture, and and they all there's usually a chart of the different rates, so it's not always just one standard rate. Um, Costa Rica has gotten pretty expensive with import importation. They've they've realized with all the people moving into the country that they should have made that a little more difficult in the beginning because it will force people to buy stuff locally versus import all their stuff. And honestly, whenever possible, and I recommend this to everybody, and I've been recommending this for two decades, if you can help it, buy stuff locally, sell your stuff at home if you're moving. It's such a pain to load everything into containers and and then you know go through customs and, and all that stuff. But and besides like the stuff that you buy down here is so much nicer. I mean if you're buying a a king bed that's handcrafted and you know carved and for I don't know six hundred dollars instead of ten thousand dollars in the store and it's you know you might as well sell your one in in North America or Europe or wherever and 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 get the local stuff it's it's generally much nicer anyway. Absolutely, and with a lot of the furniture and things that you buy down here in Central America, it's actually made for this type of heat and humidity. So if you bring things from Northern United States or Canada and things like that, a lot of it just warps really fast down here. So it's yeah. better to buy the local stuff. Yeah, they use hardwoods and you know teaks and Guanacosta and different types of woods yeah, that are Which are gorgeous, for... by the way, which are really, yeah. really nice. It's not just Ikea press board and stuff. So. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Alan says, there appeared to be house plots between the development and the beach. If so, won't those block the views? They're actually quite a bit larger than they appear on here. But yeah, eventually there will be homes in there. But uh, there's, there's some restrictions on how 
much of that you can block. And when we designed the homes for the tiny homes, we really took view corridors into account for all the homes to try to make sure that, that you could have it. Plus, you know, from your deck, uh, that's another reason why we put the rooftop decks where you, most of the time it's kind of, you know, go have a glass of wine on your rooftop and watch the sunset over the water. It's really pretty. And you'll be sitting up there and you won't be affected by many homes on the, on the front anyway. And they have a, the, the homes on the water have a height restriction of, a, of two floors. So. Perfect. Well, and it's another point for if this is something that you're interested in, then put your hand up straight away and pick the best lot. I mean, it's always going to be a yeah. first come first serve type of basis. So there's only yeah. six homes. And I think we've already got three people who are in queue now to purchase those. So um, yeah, and, and there's really no, there's, there, there's no bad lot. I mean, there, there we, like I said, you've, you've got a view from every, every, every property and, you know, you're either 150 feet away from the water or 165 feet away from the water. Right? It, it's not like you're, you're, you know, oh man, that guy's so much closer to the water than me. We really took, you know, as you saw in the master plan, it's a very rectangular plan, right? Which means everybody is taking advantage of being close to the water. Fantastic. Um, okay, Jonathan is asking questions about the residency path and eventual citizenship options for Honduras. Um, I think we kind of went over those in the presentation already. Anything else to add to that, Pat? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, like I said earlier, I, I would advise going with the, you know, whether you buy one of the homes that we've designed or not, I would advise going with the investor visa. Uh, it's just the best residency. It's the quickest path to citizenship too. And it's, relatively well it's very inexpensive compared to most countries yeah and to put things in context some of the other immigration plans that i do for people like things in europe and stuff they start at like a lot of them start at five hundred thousand euros some of them go over a million euros um even here in latin america a lot of them are two hundred thousand two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and up so being able to get your residency with a minimum investment of only $50,000 and the homes that are coming in just over 100, I mean, if you guys are looking for affordable options, this is very, very attractive. I mean, most other countries are not so, um, yeah, affordable. And we make it easy for you too, to apply for residency. We can't guarantee it. You know, they have medical tests that you have to do and criminology to, or, you know, What's it called? Police record checks that you have to get, but I mean, yeah, that's, that's standard worth saying. Here. If you, if you've spent time in prison or something like that, you are not going to get your residency here. If you, you know, had a driving under the influence, probably that's something that we can work through. Um, you know, yeah. they're really looking for like violent crime or like really serious types of crime. As long as you haven't gone through that, they're, most cases, most cases, we can deal with your immigration. And if you buy these homes, we will make sure that we put you in touch with a competent lawyer who speaks English, who will help you through the whole process for your immigration. I was just going to mention that too. We have lawyers in Honduras that speak English really well, so that, you know, it really makes the process a lot easier. Correct. Okay. Jerry asks, can I have a garden in the development? or his own trees, like his own orchard? And if so, how big? Well, obviously on the tiny home um, properties, you, you get the title for your property. It's not like, you know, you know, you own that piece of land, you can do what you want on it. You can put a garden and add more trees, want more landscaping, whatever you want to do. But they are around 2,000-ish square feet, maybe a little bit more. Uh, so it's not a, a, a huge point, but uh, like I mentioned earlier, we have the community gardens and orchards. But of course, if you wanted to, you know, have a bigger home, you're welcome to do that on a bigger lot. You can do, you know, you can do whatever you want. It's just like having your residential lot somewhere else. Yeah. So it just dependent on the size of the lot that you purchased. Yeah. If you buy exactly. a bigger lot or if you buy two lots, then you get to do what you want on it. So exactly. uh, that that's how big it is, basically, is how much you own, because these are uh, fully titled. So. Um, okay, Alan also asked, do you re recommend a referral agent or can you save money by doing it yourself? I'm not sure in terms of referral for what. I, I think we, we pretty much- Yeah, I'm not sure you. either. Alan, put, yeah. it, put it in the questions, just flesh this out a little bit for me so we can get you an answer, okay? In terms of like the purchasing of a property, uh, you know, we, you can work with 
with our lawyer, we have all the sales agreements with the developer. It's all, it's all kind of a canned package. Everybody gets the same thing. Um, obviously the, the, which, which property and which home changes, but, uh, that's all done for you already. So you, it doesn't really, you know, that we have a closing cost that's in, embedded into these, you know, if you look at the top there, it shows the numbers on the, you know, price of the home and plus closing costs. But that, that it, I would just recommend going with the, the usual route. It's a lot simpler. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can obviously hire your own lawyer if you want them to double check things, make sure it's all kosher. But, you know, there's. Yeah, we know, I know probably three or four lawyers in Honduras. But right. if there's any problems, just, you know, let me know and we'll move you to another lawyer. But I don't expect so. I mean, the one that we, uh, that Pat uses here for Honduras is fantastic. So you shouldn't have any problems there. Uh, Keith asks, build time frame and contract date estimates. I think you kind of answered that because maybe this question's from about 20 minutes ago. I'm just going in chronological order now. Right. But um, I think we said about six to six to six eight to, months, six to 10 months. Yeah, six to 10 months is a, is a, a pretty safe bet. I mean, it can be faster. It, it, part of it depends on how many they're building at one time, right? There's, there's limitations to the construction crew as well. So if there's 20 homes being built at one time or five homes being built at one time, it'll, it'll be a little, a little bit slower if there's 20, right? But mm -hmm. that's a per, that range is pretty safe. Mm -hmm. So um, Gao Shan is asking, it's kind of a, over two questions here, but uh, can the payments for the property come from his self-directed IRA? And he understands that if it's in the self-directed IRA, he, can, um, he cannot stay in it. It has to be the investment property. Yeah, I don't worry. I mean, I'm sure neither of us really want to give you too much um, details on that. That's kind of up to your, 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 your own uh, tax attorneys or whatever, but in general, at a, at a high level, yes, you can use a self-directed IRA to, to purchase these homes, but you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, a lot of developers will tell people, yeah, you can live in it, don't worry about it, but that's not the case. If you're, if you're using your, your IRA, then don't use it yourself. You know, people will find a friend sometimes and you know, each get one and then use each other's when they wanna go there, because that, that's allowed. You can rent your friends, but you can't use your own. Um, yeah, I think that if you reach out to us, then we can look at it a little bit closer with you, Gao Shan, but it's not a public recording. We probably don't want to make any guarantees for, uh, tax strategies or anything like that. But, but I, but I mean, the reality, level, yes, the reality is, you know, there's other people that are having their homes rented out there. You could stay in somebody else's while yours is being rented. It's kind of somewhat of a wash. Right? So. Uh, Alan would like to know, so foreigners can own homes in Honduras, unlike some other countries in Central and South America. Well, we have this one and Mark Cicero is also asking about how it's titled. Can you just talk to us on the titling side of things? Yeah, it's a little bit interesting in Honduras. In, in the tourist zone, they kind of recommend you create a company and title it through the company. Um, I guess they kind of want to see a little bit more um, formalness to your investment, um, for lack of a better term. Um, there is, there doesn't seem to be a hard and fast rule on that, but the lawyer suggests, in fact, this just was last week talking to her, was suggesting, you know, it's best if people applying for residency form a company, and it doesn't cost much to form a company. It probably gives you a number of other benefits, and, and you know, you can have, you know, any taxes, you know, you're going to have expenses on your home, right? So you can use those in, in that as well. So, so, I, um, for whatever reason, they, they recommend that in the tourist zones and not so much in the other areas. So it's it's probably a good idea to, to form a corporation if, if you're buying, you know, through. And then you would own the corporation and you'd use that as your investment for residency. You know, in countries like Nicaragua, that's absolutely required. Um, in Honduras, it's a little bit kind of 50-50 on the fence, but it's not a bad idea to do it anyway. It's not expensive to start a corporation and it's probably worth the perks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next question. Keep the questions coming, by the way, guys. Keep them coming. We'll try to get through as many of these as possible. Um, so we've got a question. I assume there's no issues in splitting the purchase between two friends and both are listed on the deed? Probably the easiest way is just to do a corporation and then the corporation is split between the two of you. Yeah, you can do either. But yeah, like we just talked about with the corporation, it's easiest probably to do that. You both own the company. Um, 
if you're both if you're both applying for residency though then you got to look at that because um it could work because the fifty thousand dollar limit if you're buying a hundred and twenty thousand dollar home is enough for both of you to have a fifty thousand dollar limit but you need to talk to the lawyer about the, the specifics of that i know we've done some like that in the past in some countries but um i don't know off the top of my head of any split residencies on one investment right now in in honduras okay uh, Mike would like to know how strong are the property rights in Honduras and the legal climate? You know, we get to ask that a lot. It's really not an issue that, you know, the Honduras, Nicaragua, Salvador, all these countries are other than Belize are all built are based on civil law. Uh, Belize is built based on common law. Both laws are very, very strong rights. Um, you get, you get a very formal title, very clear. You have, you know, perfect rights to your, to your property just as any other title um, that it's different than honestly than like a Mexico where if you're within 50 mile or 50 kilometers of a beach or, or of the, of the ocean or 100 kilometers of the of the border uh, then you have to go through a trust and have you know a local Mexican ownership in the trust and things and or a bank has to hold the trust so it's um, fortunately a lot cleaner than that. You have like very distinct title and deed on your property and it's in your name or your company's name completely. And, and so it's one of the reasons I invested in these countries uh, early on, even though I spent a lot of time in Mexico was for that reason, I could own it outright without anybody else involved. Fantastic. Okay, uh, maybe you can go back to the slide with the email address. George says, great, thanks for answering my questions. I will send you an email. Uh, so the, there is the email at the bottom there, expat at ecovillages.life. Um, Bruce would like to know, please talk about the banking system in Honduras. Is it as safe as Panama? Do you transfer funds by wire? Do banks need to approve a client to accept many transfers? I think what he's really trying to ask is uh, for sending money, the payments for these houses, what that would look like. Is it safe to send money down there for these? Yeah, the, you know, the, the banks in Honduras are the same banks that we have here, the same banks in Nicaragua, the same banks in Costa Rica. You have the, the, the BAC, BAC, you have Lafise, you have, these are big names in, in, you know, in this area. Uh, they're, they're massive billion dollar banks and, and they're, you know, actually some, I find, you know, on, uh, or like I said, we've, my wife and I have bought a home there too, and we're making payments. And that was one of the easiest transfers I had to do. I, used my Panamanian bank online and just sent the money for our down payment and our, our, our initial deposit, no issues. They had it within, you know, a very short period of time. Um, and so, it, you know, I, I, I've never had, in fact, you know, I, I have a bank account in, in Nicaragua, which is very similar to Honduras. And, you know, actually, Mikel, when you and I met years ago in, in Dubai, I was using my, my BAC uh, you know, debit card there from Nicaragua. Dubai? Nice. Yeah, with no issues. And uh, when I tried to use my Canadian one, I was getting, you know, blocked all the time. So I ended up using my, my Nicaraguan BAC card, which is BAC is also in Honduras. It's the same bank. So. Amazing. Okay. I'm just going through these questions here. All right. Um, uh, Diane would like to know, are there efforts in segregating permanent resident purchases from short-term rental investment homes, or are they all mixed? Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. So I understand what it, she's what they're asking. So if someone wants to buy it and they're going to be putting it into a rental pool and they're not going to be staying there versus their next door neighbor who lives there full-time, is there neighborhoods of just full-time people and neighborhoods of uh, short-term rentals or are the mixed together? Um, they're mixed, but we actually have in the rental agreement, you have a choice of kind of what we have termed in the past, like lifestyle or, or investor. And, and so if you're a lifestyle, it means you're kind of living there most of the time, but renting it out occasionally. And it comes with a little, you know, you, you won't be on the top of the list of the renters necessarily. The, the people that are buying it as an investment, as a rental property will get kind of first come first served sort of thing but that's really from the rental side but you know we, we don't really have issues in fact i really enjoy you know in all the communities that we deal with i, I really enjoy the the renters you know if you're coming down to you know honduras you're not probably coming down for a for a saturday night party right so it's 
it's not getting out of control or whatever. You're, you're yeah, this is not spring break or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Like it's not, it's not coming, your neighbors are coming right? to trash it. So. So, yeah. So, I mean, I, I find it interesting because, you you know, you're going to meet people from Europe or wherever in different parts of the world that, you know, come come there for a few weeks or a month sometimes. And so you kind of get to be get to know them, become friends and, you know, often learn get to get friends all over the world just by people that are coming and going and, and say so, yeah, we, we've never really experienced I mean there, there's some times when when there's rentals that are you know one night only on weekends or something that you know you'll have a you know a local party happen and people get a little annoyed at the noise level but that that's very uncommon okay Okay, Gaoshan asks, if I'm renting the place and I am not in Honduras and the guest has an issue or something breaks in the tiny home, who or how will it be taken care of and the repair and repair the issues? Is there a handyman on site? Yes, there's a whole property management and rental management on site. So you, that's one of the uh, agreements that you have to sign. And most good resorts, We'll, we'll make sure that they're in charge of your property management and rental management because they want their properties reflected really nicely versus if you have 10 different rental companies to choose from, you might be able to wheel and deal for the best percentage or something, but those ones are usually not the ones that are going to give a customer a good experience and they're not available, well, like you said, when something breaks or the toilet's plugged or something. So it's, you know, it's good. We actually recommend to our developers that we work with to, you know, you guys need to be in control of this. You can, you know, you can have the people on site, but you need to be in control of it. So it, they're, they're, that's all part of the agreement. You can read through it and you'll see, you know, the, the rules, but it, it's, yeah, they, you know, there, there's, there's limits. Like if something under a hundred dollars breaks or whatever, they are allowed to, you know, fix it without requesting your permission. Or if it's an emergency situation, like a water pipe would break or something, they need to stop it or fix it, or, you know, that mm -hmm. sort of thing is kind of like a emergency situation. And then there's like, you know, your, your fridge is, is dying and, you know, we, you should really consider getting a new one and it's $700. So do you want us to get one or not? Right. They'll ask you. So. Fantastic. Okay. We are down to our last three questions. I'm going to bang through these. If you guys have more questions, make sure to put them in the chat box so I can see them. Um, otherwise we'll be wrapping this up in the next, you know, three or four minutes. Okay. Um, so Alan got back to us. The referral agent fee is listed in the annual expenses, and he was guessing at what it is. He says, uh, "Thanks." Uh, I think I think I got it now. Yeah, so I think I do too. When, but you go, and if if you don't get it, then I think I've got it. So okay, so I, I think he's talking about is like a a referral agent for rentals. I, I was thinking of buying, and so I wasn't really on the right page. But yeah, so you know when you use an Expedia or a Travelocity or any of these kind of companies or a local agent or whatever, they get a percentage of, you know, of the rental for giving the client, you know, bringing the lead in. If you're bringing in your own lead and you're doing it and you're, you know, you contact the front office for the rentals and say, this is, this is John and he's going to be staying, you know, October 21st to 28th. Um, you get that referral back onto your balance sheet, basically. So, you know, it's, I, we do that with our own, you know, homes on my, my wife, Andrea and I, like if we, know somebody's coming down or needs a place to stay, we'll send them, yeah, go stay in our place. Cause we, you know, we can give them a break on the rent too, because we can say, okay, well, we'll deduct that referral fee or, or, you know, if we don't know them, maybe we won't deduct it, but we'll, we'll get that in our, in our pocket rather in Expedia's pocket or whoever. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's what I was thinking. I think, as soon as he said from the annual expenses, then I knew what it was. Uh, yeah, so, okay. Alan, that's Sorry awesome. Sorry about Thanks that. For... No, no, Alan, Thank you so much for, for letting us know. Now we know what it is. And Pat, I, I was on the, I wasn't sure at first as well. So that's good. Uh, Jerry says, what is the healthcare services like um, for someone with health issues? Are there any hospitals in La Ceiba close by? There's actually some really good hospitals. And my wife, did, my wife's a doctor and she did a lot of research on the hospitals that are there. Um, if you do send us a message at expat, uh, uh, the email address there we can give you i know she's done a bunch of research she can tell you about the different hospitals and uh you know there's some pretty high quality hospitals in the country and uh you know medical care is extremely inexpensive in these countries um you know I, i've got my my kidney stone story i could regale you with but it make a long story short it cost me like under 60 dollars to get 
you know, two urologist checkups and blood tests and medication and everything. And so I, you know, I, I don't worry about the cost. We, we now have a medical insurance package because my wife is a doctor and makes me get one. But otherwise, you know, it's, it's just very inexpensive. Okay. Um, all right. We are down to our very last question. Uh, okay, Jonathan would like to know, how safe is Laceba? I have concerns because Honduras is listed as having a higher crime rate. We touched on this a little bit before. Uh, Pat, you go, and then I want to add something to this as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really hard to kind of explain as to people that, that haven't really been on the ground there. <clears throat> it's, it's very safe. It's a tourist zone. It, the government doesn't want problems in their tourist zone. So there, it's, it's very safe. Now, you know, it's a lot safe. It's not the safest place on the planet. But if you use your brain and you're not involved with gangs and drugs, you'll be perfectly fine. But, you know, if you look at any city just about in the U.S. these days, or not any city, but, you know, obviously the Chicago's, the St. Louis, New Orleans, even Minnesota or uh, Minneapolis is, you know, some of them are double, triple the, the, the crime rate of, of La Ceiba. So it's all kind of relative. I was looking at it this afternoon and going, wow, I didn't realize that. Minneapolis. I grew up just north of Minneapolis in Canada, and we used to go down there all the time. And you know, obviously, and it's gotten a lot worse in the last number of years. But um, you know, the thing with Honduras and Salvador and these countries, they're really cracking down on gangs. So their crime rates are going way, way down every year, while a lot of cities in the U.S. are going up. So you know, it's it's really. I think the best advice I can say is just come down and visit. You know, you'll go out to some restaurants or bars or whatever and go go shopping in the, in the mall in La Ceiba, hang out at different, you know, go for a round of golf, whatever you like to do. And you'll realize this is just like any other place if I'm not, you know, ridiculous about being out there drunk at 2 a.m. And, and picking on a local or something. I'm not going to have any problems. Right? So. Yeah. And just from my side, um, how to say this nicely. The countries down here in Latin America, when you have a tourist zone and you have uh, foreigners coming down, tourists coming down and spending money, if the tourist gets attacked or robbed or, you know, held up or something like that, the consequences for a person doing this crime are often very severe. The police really don't like it when you rob the tourists or attack the tourists. So people know, don't mess with the tourists because there's there's very big repercussions for these types of things. So I'm not trying to say like we have special privileges or special rights or something like that, but it's just kind of part of the reality. We are, as expats and foreigners, we're bringing money into these countries. It's foreign direct investment. They want to protect this investment. They want to have a good reputation. So Although you can look at statistics and Honduras is not going to come up as the safest country in the world, that's for sure. But they mix in the numbers from drug dealers and gangs and things like that in with the overall numbers. So those numbers that you see are not reflected on people targeting tourists or expats. Does that make sense? I hope so, right? Yeah, and I think I, I totally agree, Kel. And I think the other thing to add is that you have to adjust your perception a little bit. A lot of these countries allow their military or their police officers to kind of moonlight as security guards too, right? So they'll work in front of a bank on their off days and or whatever it is. And companies will hire these guys. They'll have, you know, rifles or machine guns or whatever they're, they're carrying and, or guns. It looks intimidating, but, you know, sometimes I guess looks intimidating helps too, right? So you, know, you don't see the, the crime, but... It, it, so it takes a little bit of getting used to. It. I don't even notice it anymore. But often when I'm, you know, visited by somebody that doesn't spend much time in Latin America, they're like, "Oh wow, there's a, you know, a guy with a gun on the corner." It's like, yeah, he's a cop being a security guard for that parking lot. He just happens to have a gun because he's a cop. Um, so that's just how it works here. And I, I, I forget that that's a, you know, a thing, right? So, mm -hmm. so it, you know, it, again, and like you said, the governments are very, very uh, into promoting tourism and investment in these countries. And the last thing they need is somebody getting hurt or being on the news or, you know, that they've been robbed or whatever. So you, you rarely ever hear of that. You know, the, the only thing you hear is these generalized crime stats on mainstream media. And, you know, it's a little frustrating, honestly, when you live down here and 
you feel way safer than you do in North America. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I think we are at time. That's pretty much all of the questions. So I hope that we got to, to everybody and we got your questions answered. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed today's presentation. We're really doing our best here to bring you guys honest and upfront information about this. We're not sugarcoating things. We're telling you guys as it is. I'm really trying to bring you fantastic opportunities, things that I'm often investing in myself. Um, you know, and just things that you're not going to hear about anywhere else. So I hope that you got a lot of value out of today's presentation. Uh, I will make sure that I send this out to everybody who registered today. Um, and if you guys want more information, if you want to ask Pat questions or uh, speak to Andrea about things, there should be an email address on the screen for you there. It is expat at ecovillages.life.life. And uh, I'm sure they will be more than happy to help you out with that. Yeah, we, we love helping people relocate and do what we did and, you know, have the awesome lifestyle that we're able to have down here and very grateful for that. And, and like, you know, we were talking about dinner last night. It was really fun with a lot of people that are just great, like-minded people having a good time. And so I hope, I hope a lot of people got some good information out of this presentation and maybe we'll become our neighbors. Thanks Amazing. very much, Mikel, for having me on the presentation. Thank you, Pat, for taking the time out. And uh, Alan says, thank you so much. This was super interesting. Uh, Uraj says, greetings. I joined the program a little bit late. He wants to know when the project will be completed. In a nutshell, uh, there is six homes left. Well, probably only two or three after today's presentation. But uh, delivery time is within the next six months or so. And it is possible to get your residency. So if you want more information, send an email to... Uh, expat at ecovillages.life and that's it let's wrap it up i hope everyone has a great night and i'm off to uruguay this weekend so i won't see any of the emails coming in but uh i trust pat and the team to take good care of you and chris says thanks Mikel and pat our pleasure chris happy to see you and i'll see you this week as well thanks guys talk to you soon bye everyone